Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 23. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're fixing to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. And in our last lecture, we left off with the completion of all of the building that uh, was done under King Solomon. And when you consider, now Solomon is the third man king of Israel. So we're not very far into the kings at this point, uh, being my point. Uh, Saul, of course, uh, of uh, the tribe of Benjamin, was the first king of all of Israel. Uh, David, uh, Solomon's father, first king over Judah only for seven years and then uh, grew, uh, gathered all of Israel back together under his reign for 33 years and now Solomon. And Solomon's into approximately his 23rd or 24th year of his reign out of his 40 years that he reigned. And he's fixing to uh, have a visitor, the Queen of Sheba. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 23. And it reads, These were the chief of the officers that were over Solomon's work. 550 which bear rule over the people that wrought in the work. Now don't be confused, this is talking about those who were involved in the construction of first the temple of God, then uh, Solomon's own palace, uh, the house of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, the house of the forest of Lebanon, uh, the king's uh, house of cedars where his throne was, where he entertained uh, foreign visitors and, and executed judgment as well. What these are are, are the construction uh, boss foreman, you might, straw boss is what we called them when I was younger. Uh, uh, those who were responsible for supervising the work, making sure that progress on the work was done efficiently and people weren't getting in each other's way. In 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 10, it states that he had 250 uh, who were supervising the work there that was of Israel only. Here, the 550, in other words, uh, uh, 300 of the 550 were of foreign uh, descent, probably uh, Canaanites uh, 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 that showed... Uh, uh, in, uh, uh, showed ability to, to communicate the work that needed to be done, and so on. Verse 24, But Pharaoh's daughter came up out of the city of David unto her house, which Solomon had built for her. Then did he build Milo. And of course, Pharaoh's daughter would have stayed in uh, the lower city, Jerusalem, which was actually separate from the citadel uh, where Jerusalem, uh, the, the castle, the palace, if you would, was. And she would have been allowed to stay in that area because she was a Gentile. And so they kept her in the lower city until Solomon was able to complete her house and then she moved up into the king's palatial complex. <clears throat> Milo, interesting, you, you see it pop up from time to time. Uh, throughout Samuel, the Kings, and Chronicles. Milo actually means rampart or mound. Uh, it existed uh, by this name, Milo, even at the time that the Jebusites controlled uh, the area, which of course then it was called Jebus uh, rather than Jerusalem, not until David uh, conquered the citadel of, of Jerusalem, Jebus, did he change the name of the city to Jerusalem? 
Solomon rebuilt it and fortified it. Uh, Hezekiah, also a very pious and righteous king, uh, also uh, refortified Milo. Verse 25. And three times in a year did Solomon offer burnt offerings and peace offerings upon the altar which he built unto the Lord. And he burnt incense upon the altar that was before the Lord, so he finished the house. And I think this stated to indicate that Solomon no longer went to Gibeon where the uh, Mosaic tabernacle, the tent of Moses' time, had been located, which is where he went initially when he became king to make sacrifice. It is also written that he sacrificed in the high places, which was illegal worship of Yahweh. But here now he's saying he worshiped only and made sacrifice only where God put his name, which was in Jerusalem uh, on uh, the, the Temple Mount. Three times a year, uh, probably relating to the Passover, uh, also the Feast of Weeks, uh, now called Pentecost, and then in the fall, the Feast of Tabernacles, the three major ingatherings. And, and I probably have been a little lax in, in, in announcing, especially for our younger viewers, we've been talking about animal sacrifice quite a bit. And I want to be sure that you understand, you younger viewers, that we don't offer animals to our Heavenly Father today, uh, thinking that that would be pleasing to Him as it was pleasing at the time of Solomon. Uh, something's happened since the time of Solomon. Uh, that, of course, is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. He became the sacrifice for one and all time. And it would definitely be an insult to God if you uh, were to take an animal and offer it to the Lord. It would not be pleasing to him at all. It would be an abomination after he sacrificed his only begotten son. Verse 26, And King Solomon made an, a navy of ships in Ezion, Ezion Geber, uh, which is beside Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. Now, what this is talking about, you see, Israel had conquered the Ammonites, the Moabites, and then if you move on, and that's on the east side of Jordan, and then if you move on further south from there, you would find at this time the land of Edom. If you were to go to the Dead Sea, the south, southern tip of the Dead Sea, and draw a line straight south uh, until you got to the Persian Gulf, that is where this Ezion Geber would be. It's a, a port city uh, where it gave Solomon and his shipmen access to the waterways of the Persian Gulf. Uh, this area Ezion Geber was located in is called the Gulf of Aqaba and uh, is well known even into this time. But uh, without this port, you see, Israel only had access to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, by getting access to the water on the Persian Gulf, uh, this gave them a lot more uh, areas that they could get to in less time. And <clears throat> this uh, when Edom revolted, uh, this was lost under, uh, but then under King Uzziah of Israel, it was uh, retaken, but then it was lost and finally lost uh, during the reign of Ahaz, uh, king of Judah, verse 27. And Hiram, Hiram was the kind of a, the king of Tyre was kind of a business partner with Solomon, sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea with the servants of Solomon. And uh, Tyre was a trading center. Uh, they, f for all over the world, uh, and they had shipmen who were knowledgeable in, in long voyages. Uh, 
they were in cahoots with the Phoenicians come to mind. And some believe, and I'll add my, I'll throw my hat in with those who believe that the Phoenicians were so skilled in, in sea uh, transportation that they visited the Americas centuries uh, before Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Uh, very skilled and knowledgeable navigators uh, for the long voyages. Verse 28, And they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to King Solomon. And we'll learn in the next uh, chapter that it was every three years that they returned and they brought this much gold as well as, as other uh, valuable uh, resources from Ophir. Ophir always known as the finest and the purest gold. Uh, where it is located uh, today has been lost. The, uh, it seems that when the captivity of Judah ended, that Ophir was never mentioned again. So uh, I know a lot of people would like to know where Ophir was so they would know where all of this gold and the other precious resources that they obtained there came from, uh, but again, lost in antiquity. Chapter 10, uh, if I were to entitle the chapter, I'd list it as Solomon's Prosperity and Riches. And the first part of this chapter uh, we have the Queen of Sheba uh, coming to visit <coughs> Solomon. Let's go with chapter 10, verse 1. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. In other words, she posed riddles to him. Uh, she had heard of Solomon's wisdom, and therefore she was... Uh, posing these uh, riddles to test his wisdom. Now, some, uh, I don't like to quote the Koran uh, that much, but in, in the Koran, the Queen of Sheba is named and called Balkis, and it's thought that she was from the area that would be uh, Yemen of today, which is quite possible. I believe that uh, that these were Sabians uh, who were well known for their trade in precious metals, uh, spices, uh, things of that nature. Verse 2, And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, a long caravan, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones, and when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. Sheba, uh, no doubt, a very wealthy nation as Israel was at this time as well. Uh, this long train or caravan, uh, she was bringing gifts uh, to gain the favor, no doubt, of Solomon. And also, being this long of a train or caravan, uh, no doubt some of her uh, entourage was military. You see, it was dangerous to travel uh, through many parts of the world at this time, and no doubt she had military to protect her. While she was within the, the borders of Israel, no doubt Solomon would have provided some protection uh, his army for her, but uh, they, were, they did a lot of traveling that was not within the borders of Israel, uh, obviously. Verse 3, And Solomon told her, or answered, all of her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which, she, uh, which he told her not. He answered all of her riddles, all of her questions. And we kind of start to see the pride build a little bit among Solomon as we work our way through this chapter in chapter 11. And he forgot to give credit where credit was due for his wisdom. Who, who, who gave Solomon that wisdom? Chapter 3 of the same book. You know it was our Heavenly Father. 
answered Solomon's prayer and gave him wisdom. He forgot to give her, uh, him, I should say, credit. Uh, verse 4, And when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom and the house, the dwelling that he had built, and this would be the, his personal house, of course, uh, she being a uh, heathen uh, Gentile would not have been allowed anywhere near the house of God. Verse 5, And the meat, the food of his table, and the sitting of his servants, this referring to the furniture, and the attendance or the standing, the arrangement of offices of his ministers and their apparel, and his cupbearers, these are, are known butlers, would be a good way to think of them, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. This word spirit could be translated breath. When she saw the uh, food on the table, the furniture, the, the organization of the arrangement of offices and all the, the clothing of his uh, ministers and the cupbearers and the ascent, the walkway up to the house of God. It took her breath away. She, she was impressed. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. What I heard it was so much that I had to make the journey here to see if it were true. And it's much more than true. And I'm sure about this time Solomon's head is getting larger and larger. And he's probably thinking, oh, my Queen of Sheba, you are such a good judge of character. Please continue on. She does. Howbeit, I believed not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. And I had to come to check it out for myself. But even what I heard was only half of the, the wonderful uh, things that you've done here in Jerusalem. Verse 8, Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Those who work in and around you should feel lucky uh, to be part of your organization and to have you on the king and such a wise king. And again, he's saying, tell me more, Queenie. Verse 9, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. Now, this, you know, blessed be the Lord thy God. This is coming from a heathen. And just like the Hiram, king of Tyre, referred to Yahweh, and, and it, it, I think it's she, queen of Sheba, just like he, Hiram, king of Tyre, probably believed in Yahweh as much as they believed in the gods, their own gods of their own lands. No sacrifice is mentioned, no sign of conversion on her part, uh, but she's impressed. Verse 10, And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold, a talent being a hundred and ten to a hundred and eighty pounds, depending on whose measurement you go by. That's a lot of gold. Uh, if you put the pencil to it at, oh, say, $1,100 an ounce, I think is the current price for gold right about in there, uh, that'd be very, very uh, large amount of uh, value. And the spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these, which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Now these spices that are referred to in this verse, uh, we wouldn't think of them as we think of spices that we would use to cook with, to prepare a meal. Uh, what we're talking about here, and the word means in the Hebrew, uh, actually fragrance. 
and I think it's probably from the balsam plant. Verse 11, And the navy, these are the ships of Tarshish, also of Hiram, that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almug trees and precious stones. These almug trees are called algum trees in the book of Chronicles, and it's thought that it's probably red sandalwood. Uh, this wood was utilized to make the walkway uh, from the king's palace up to the house of God. It was also utilized in making musical instruments, very valuable wood. Verse 12, And the king made of the almug trees pillars for the house of the Lord, and for the king's house, this is the walkway we're talking about, the railings, harps also, and psalteries for singers, for the musicians. There came so much almug trees, uh, nor were seen uh, unto this day. Verse 13, And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. In other words, he returned some of the gifts that she brought to him, but then before she left, he said, well, look around, is there anything else that you would like? So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. She brought a load of goodies and she took a load of goodies home. Verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred, three score, and six talents of gold. Whoa, six hundred, that's six. Three score is sixty, that's another six. And six talents of gold. Uh, does that number seem familiar to you? It should. Six, six, six is the number of the, the beast of Revelation, the Antichrist. And here we see it, Bullinger calls the number also symbolic of the height or essence of man's desire. But as Solomon would later state himself in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 2, you know, verses 8 through 11, he, he lists everything that he gained in, in, the, in the flesh body the riches that he had. But then he pointed out that actually everything in the long uh, understanding of things is vanity, which means nothing. You know, it, it's that, that's so true that it doesn't matter how much wealth you accumulate in the flesh. When you die, you're not taking any of it with you. It's, it's vanity, it's nothing. As we learn in the book of Revelations, chapter 14, verse 13, the only thing that you can take with you and you do take with you are your works. Whether good or bad, your works do follow you when you pass away in the flesh. But 666 talents of gold uh, came to Solomon year by year. That's a lot of gold. Verse 15. Beside that, he had the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors or captains of the country. And what this is talking about, we mentioned in our last lecture uh, about the uh, transport of goods from the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf. They didn't have the Suez Canal at this time, and the only way to go by water from the Mediterranean to the Persian was all the way around the Horn of Africa. We're talking about a long, long journey. But what they would do is put into port on the Mediterranean Sea, and then by caravan move goods across uh, what at this time was controlled by Israel. And uh, these tr men, merchant men, and those who trafficked in spices uh, would no doubt pay uh, uh, tribute to Solomon, uh, and if nothing else, to stay in good favor with such a powerful king. 
<clears throat> verse 16, And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold or pure gold, 600 shekels of gold to one target. Now, uh, these targets were very large shields. Uh, at this time when they made war, uh, a lot of it was pretty much hand-to-hand -hand combat. And these large shields were utilized and carried by footmen uh, to protect themselves. Uh, for example, if the enemy launched an archery attack against them, you may have seen movies where then they would take these large shields and use them for protection from the hundreds of arrows that were launched toward them. Uh, and as large as they were, they could even use them uh, by driving them into the ground and using them effectively more than one would serve some protection from an oncoming cavalry charge. Uh, they also, uh, the, the large targets had uh, sharp points or daggers on the, the opposite side of the, the one who was carrying the shield. In other words, it had some, uh, not only did it have defensive purposes, it had some offensive purposes as well due to these daggers that were attached. Verse 18, moreover, the king made, uh, I'm sorry, I missed verse 17. Let's back up and catch it. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. These would be uh, smaller shields. Three pound of gold went to one shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. This word pound, check it out in the Hebrew, is mané which means one, and I think it, it means 100 shekels of gold. Because in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 16, these same uh, smaller shields uh, are state that there were 300 shekels of, of gold in each of the shields. 600 shekels in the larger uh, targets, and then uh, we would have, excuse me, 200 yeah, 600 shekels of gold in the larger targets, 300 shekels in the smaller. Now, these were, as, as many of you know, the properties of metal know that gold is not a very hard metal. And these were utilized more for uh, pomp, if you will, and uh, events of state. Uh, occasions of state such as when a foreign visitor came such as the Queen of Sheba that we covered in our earlier uh, part of this lecture. Now under Rehoboam the son of Solomon both these targets and these shields were stolen by Shishak uh, the Egyptian. Uh, Rehoboam went to replace them but all he had to work with rather than gold was uh, brass or bronze, better translated probably, because Shishak took all the gold as well. And what they were made of probably was wood and then what would normally be covered, the shields I'm talking about, were made of a basic construction of wood and then overlaid or plated with gold where the leather would normally be placed. Verse 18, Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold, the best gold, no doubt, from Ophir. <clears throat> the throne had six steps, and the top, or you could think of this as a canopy, of the throne was round behind the hinder part. And there were stays, these are armrests. Uh, the Hebrew for this word is hands, which is where the king placed his hands on the armrest, on either side on the place of the seat. And two lions stood beside the stays. Now, the lion, symbolic of the tribe of Judah, uh, also the king of the jungle. Uh, and then there are more lions on the steps, verse 20. And twelve lions stood there on one side, and on the other upon the six steps. 
there were, was not the like made in any kingdom. It was quite a throne, and this kind of loses what it, in the translation, but there were six steps going ascending up to Solomon's throne. And on the left, if you were looking at his throne, on the left would be six lions, and on the right, six lions. And of course, each one of these lions, one represented one of the tribes of Israel. So we have uh, the lion of Judah. We have the lion being the king of the jungle. We have the lions representing the whole nation of Israel being at the, the king's foot, feet, is what this is saying. Verse 21, uh, God was rewarding Solomon uh, greatly. You remember back in chapter 3, God said, ask whatever you will of me, and Solomon asked for wisdom. And God said, well, since you didn't ask for the life of your enemy or great riches for yourself or a long life for yourself, I'll add all these things on to you uh, because you asked for wisdom to rule this people. 21, and all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon, or silver was counted as nothing. You could translate this. When we get to verse 27, we'll learn that uh, Solomon gave silver away like stones, like rocks, uh, because uh, there was so much wealth. 22, for the king had at uh, sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. In other words, ships that were uh, longer than, than others built for long voyages. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish bringing gold and silver ivory and apes and peacocks. And this ivory, if you have a reference Bible, you probably have a, a note that this is elephant's teeth, probably better elephant's tusks. Now, where would you get the tusks, ivory of elephants and apes, which were probably sought after for uh, entertainment purposes, and peacocks for their beauty, where would you find those things? Well, Africa comes to my mind. I don't know about yours. So, and many believe that Ophir uh, probably was in the northern half of Africa. Verse 23, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. In chapter 3, verse 13, God said, Because you didn't ask for anything for yourself, I'll add all these things on to you. And I'm going to make you the most, the wisest and the, mo the wealthiest king of all time. And uh, certainly Solomon known for his wisdom. And we see the riches coming in. Uh, and who was it? It was God's blessings upon Solomon. Uh, up to this point, Solomon had done things right. He had done things God's way. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to see that we're right now at about the height of Solomon's reign as king of Israel. Uh, the latter, almost half of his reign, things start going downhill in a hurry. We'll cover it in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast.
You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization. Uh, we try and teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? You can do away with the telephone number. We don't need that. You won't need that. You won't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. And you know, it pleases him when you talk to him. He's just like, uh, he has emotions and feelings. We're created in his image, so he has emotions and feelings just like you do. Well, let me ask you, if you were a parent and you had a child that when they graduated high school, they took off and you never heard from them again, unless they needed something from you. Oh, help me, I, I need to make my mortgage payment and I can't do it this month. Uh, and that's the way it is with God's children. Sometimes the only time he hears from them is when they have trouble in their lives. Uh, never do they say thank you for the blessings. Uh, think about it, uh, consider it. Uh, he's just like us. He wants to, to hear from you. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, problem marriages, financial difficulties. You know, Father. We also lift up our military troops who uh, more and more of them are in harm's way. Uh, we ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, and heal in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up today, we have David in Oregon. Is King David related to Joshua, the one who led God's people into the promised land? Well, not a direct descendant uh, of uh, David is not directly descended from Joshua because if you go to Luke chapter 3, which is the genealogy of Mary's family, in other words, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, uh, Joshua is not in that lineage. Now, Joshua was the son of Nun, who was of the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, David was of Judah, of course, but both were descendants from Jacob, uh, uh, so very, very distantly related, I guess you could say. Linda in Illinois, pastor, you stated that there were other races from the six-day creation. Please give me scripture to know the truth in this matter. I believe to be that Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day and God rested on the seventh day. Well, that's not the way things happen chronologically in God's Word. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, you have God along about verse 26 or 27. Uh, God says, let us, referring to the angels with him, make man in our own image. And that is the sixth day creation, the races other than Eth ha Adam, the man Adam, who was created in Genesis chapter 2. The beginning of Genesis chapter 2, God it was the seventh day, and God rested. Then he created Eth ha Adam, from whence uh, one of his ribs uh, was created Eve. So uh, the six day creation, the races were created, 
The seventh day was a Sabbath. God rested. The eighth day he created Eth Ha'adam. There were people on earth before Adam and Eve. You know, anyone with any education in biology at all knows that it would be impossible to take two people of the same race and then have them have descendants that were different races. That's, that's biologically impossible. So uh, there were other races created by God, not all descended from Adam and Eve. Jim in Florida, I have heard the pastor say Satan has two horns and will look just like Jesus. Also, there were earlier Bibles that said Moses had horns after he came down from the mount. So my question is, does Jesus, Satan, and Moses have horns? No. Uh, horns are, in some cases, symbolic of power. And Moses, when he had horns, they were symbolic of power. There was a, a one uh, under the prophet uh, Micaiah uh, that was copying Moses, actually, and he took horns and said, we're going to have the victory over these our enemies, da-da-da-da-da-da. Uh, he was not uh, uh, a prophet of God. No horns. Now, the horns you're referring to that, that Satan will have, or you can read about in Revelation uh, chapter 13, verse 11, and that's the beast, the Antichrist, had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. In other words, he looked like Jesus, but he spoke like the devil. And you don't want to get yourself into a situation to where you're deceived by his looks. Uh, always test the fruit. Um, you don't get uh, uh, figs from uh, an olive tree or vice versa. Jack in Pennsylvania. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Uh, Stay away from Gentiles. Can you please explain? Well, that was time specific. At that time, and what that is happening there in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples. They're about to graduate and become apostles, one who are sent forth is what apostles means. And he's telling them, don't go to the Gentiles. Why? Because the price uh, had not been paid on the cross by Jesus, which did open salvation to all, including the Gentiles. After the crucifixion, salvation was open to all. In fact, that was Paul's uh, great commission Acts chapter 9, verse 15. He was sent first to the Gentiles, second to the kings, third to the children of Israel. Teresa in Oklahoma, Luke 21, 20, when it says to flee Judea to the mountains, are we Judea? No, Judea is a geographical location. Uh, in verse 20 there of Luke chapter 21, when you see Jerusalem compassed, uh, make a note of Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, talking about the same event, uh, uh, getting close to the Lord's day, getting close to when the desolation, the desolator is nigh. That's the Antichrist. Uh, he's going to set his throne up on the north side of the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. And what it's saying there, the words of Jesus, is get out of Jerusalem when the desolator is there. Mr. H. from Illinois. Hello, Pastor Dennis. Hello, back. My question is, I know you can't tell anyone where to go to church <clears throat> but my grandson likes going to church with me. He's ADHD, but is very wise. But they teach rapture. I have tried to plant seeds there. 
<coughs> excuse me, I tell him I'm going to have to find another church. He cries and said it's not fair. He likes going to church there. Would it be wrong if I take him out or can I tell him the truth when he's older and that would be okay with God? The pastor teaches some truth, but to me he gets lost and he gets things, lots of things mixed up. Okay, Mr. H. Well, you know, and I understand your situation and, and you're right. I, I'm not going to uh, tell you where you should go to church. Uh, you're going to have to pray about that and take it up with your Heavenly Father. It may be that God has you in that church, just as you said, to plant a seed of truth. But uh, God bless you. And you know what? Uh, at least uh, the churches who are mixed up and lost, as you said, get lots of things mixed up, at least they teach morals. And, you know, that's something that's lacking in our society today. Uh, when you have kids shooting kids uh, and, and uh, nutcases uh, murdering innocent people, uh, something's wrong, and, and it's, I think that we don't have morals taught in our society. Clara in Nevada, um, does the devil see and hear everything I do and say? Please let me know the answer to my question. Uh, Satan and his can see and hear. Uh, but you know what? They cannot read your mind. God is the only one who is what is called in the Greek cardio knower, the heart knower, if you will. So, uh, but Satan and his, yeah, they can hear and they can see uh, what's going on and they can use it against you if you don't have Jesus Christ with you. But as it's written in Luke chapter uh, 10 verses 17, 18, and 19, you have power over all of your enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. That includes uh, Satan and his. Teresa in Missouri, where in the Bible does it say where the dead are? Well, you have many locations that tell us where the dead are. Uh, that was the subject of Paul's writings on many occasions. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, also 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, which is ironic. That's the, the scripture that the rapturists use uh, to support their theory of the rapture, uh, when in fact the subject of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, if you go back up to verse 13 there, you find that the subject is don't be ignorant like the heathen as to where uh, the dead are, those who are asleep in Christ. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 in the Old Testament tell us that when the silver cord parts, and uh, that's a figure of speech meaning when we die, the flesh goes back to the earth from which it came, the Spirit goes back uh, to our Heavenly Father from which it came. Charles in Texas, the Song of Moses, uh, and someone copied down, or you stated wrong, Genesis chapter 32. That's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 is where you find the Song of Moses. Does it appear in the King James Version the same as it appears in the original Hebrew manuscripts. Yes, it's uh, an accurate uh, translation. Uh, the verse you mentioned, verse 43, uh, is nations, uh, or I should say the, the, the verse mentions nations there. Uh, in the Hebrew tongue, the nations are goy, or Gentiles, and that simply means those who are not of Israel the ten tribes scattered that is talking about there. Kim in Virginia, thank you for your ministry and teaching. God bless you and your family. Thank you for that and, and blessings back to you as well. Please explain and give the scripture as to the life of a believer after the death of the physical body. What do they do 
uh, there in Abraham's bosom, and Kim's referring to uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 22, in the following verses, where we have uh, Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, Lazarus lived a righteous life in the flesh. The rich man uh, had a lot of ill-gotten gains. He lived an extravagant life. But there's a gulf in paradise, is the teaching of Luke chapter 16. <clears throat> on the rich man ended up on the wrong side of the gulf. But he could see Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham on the other side of the gulf. And that's where you want to be. Uh, you can bet that wherever Abraham was, that Jesus was not too far away. If you have an Apocrypha, uh, you want to make a note of 2 Esdras chapter 7, verse 77 and the following verses, and that gives a, a little more detail about what it's like on the wrong side of paradise, the wrong side of the gulf. Earl from Colorado. Uh, my wife died at the age of 37, when we're sorry for your loss, Earl. She left me with four wonderful children. My question is, can she see my and her children or have any knowledge of their lives from heaven? And again, we're uh, sorry for your loss, uh, and I, I greatly respect you for taking the bull by the horns, and I'm sure you're doing a good job of raising those four children on your own. And to answer your question though, I don't believe that God allows uh, those who have passed on to see into this, our dimension, any more than we can see into the dimension that they are in. Now, having said all that, I do know of certain circumstances uh, that when a loved one is uh, having a particularly difficult time with the loss of a loved one, uh, I believe that God, uh, and I've heard people tell me accounts where uh, that the spirit of the deceased is allowed to come back to them for a short, brief period of time and only once. Uh, to, and it's basically uh, God letting them know and the loved one who's passed away letting them know, hey, I'm not dead, I'm still alive, I'm, everything's okay. We'll see you when you get over on the side that I'm on. Bill in California, when Satan comes here for five months, can I tell him to move on and leave me alone? Well, that'd be one way to do it, but uh, I mentioned Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 18 and 19 a few minutes ago. You have power over all your enemies. However, you know, if you are one of God's elect, you have a destiny, and your destiny is to be delivered up before the Antichrist. And the Holy Spirit is going to speak that uh, cloven tongue, that language that everyone uh, no matter what their native language is, can understand, and the Holy Spirit will witness through you. You don't want to deny that destiny. Gala in Arizona. I was baptized under the thought of the rapture theory. Am I still saved? Well, of course you're still saved. The rapture theory didn't baptize you. You were just being taught falsely about the rapture. You were baptized, I hope, in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and in the words of Paul, there is one God, there is one baptism. <clears throat> Viola in Missouri. Are the five loaves and two fishes any way related to the seven seals? No, I don't see the connection uh, in biblical numerics, the number five is the number associated, excuse me, with grace. Uh, the number two is the father and son uh, also witness. Delman in Tennessee, where do black uh, nations come from? Um, uh, black people as the other races other than the descendants of 
Eth Ha Adam, as I mentioned earlier, were created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God said to the angels, let us make man in our image. In the last verse of chapter 1, verse 31, God says, God saw everything that he had made and it was very good. James in Arizona, will the Shepherd's Chapel ever be in text format on an e-reader, for example, uh, and you mention a specific product, I'm not going to mention it because that's kind of an advertisement. We have no immediate plans, but keep it in prayer. I'll tell you, technology is advancing so rapidly, it's, uh, uh, to, and you have to keep up with the Joneses. I'll tell you, I had someone tell me uh, 10 years ago that uh, the internet would eventually replace television. I didn't believe him 10 years ago, but uh, things are popping in that direction. Mary in Michigan, where does it say in the Bible about the blood on the moon? Uh, you can read about it in the Old Testament in Joel chapter 2, verse 31. Uh, also in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, uh, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Revelation 6.12. All have to do with the deception of Antichrist and to be ready for that before the Lord returns. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know what? It makes His day, too, when He looks down and He sees you reading the letter that he wrote to you, the Bible, it makes his day. You make his day, he's going to make yours. That's when the blessings really start to flow in your life. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, though, is this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.